the devastation of record-breaking oil prices may be the thing that propels us to seek more diversity in our energy sources. The way we have gotten ourselves into where we are in the world right now was the demand surprise of China. The way we can transform the world into a world that we can have the things we want to have is to transform how we think about the energy world. And we need to start by thinking about demand, not supply. And demand could be the big surprise in the world. Just like it surprises how big it became in China, demand could surprise us again on how we actually think about ourselves, think about what we need to have done, what other comforts we want to have, heat, light, air conditioning, mobility, uh, and all those services we want, but start with demand. How much do we really need to use to have what we want to have at the end of the day? That means we have to think about efficiency, but also just think about what is the end product we want to actually have? Can we do it differently? And there are ways of having the comforts we want to have by doing it differently. But start with demand. Most areas of our use of energy in general, and that applies to oil, coal, gas, electricity, uh, there are technologies today for the, for the same use that exist that are probably 20 to 25 percent more efficient in the use of that, that, that energy form or fuel than the current average technology. What, we need to accelerate the introduction of those technologies into our system. The rise in prices uh, during the late spring, uh, summer of uh, 2008 were, I think, the aha moment for the American people. There is nothing like $4 gasoline to focus the mind. And really, you see oil and, uh, and our energy issues going from what I'd say is a mid-tier issue where people were very concerned about um, politically and always like, yes, we want to get off for foreign oil, as they would say, um, really rising to the top issue and demanding from political leaders real solutions that deal with the fundamentals of the problem. And so I think Americans are tired of, you know, we can sit here all we want and bash OPEC, we can bash big oil, we can bash speculators, but I think they ultimately understand the fundamentals, which are supply and demand. You need to reduce your demand, you need to increase your supply, and at the same time, we need to quickly drive to alternatives so that we no longer have the problems of just oil, where we have choice. And so oil is not 97% uh, of our entire transportation sector, but is more like 40%, 30%, 20% of our transportation sector. And we see ourselves using a, a healthy use of biofuels, probably third generation biofuels, and electricity to actually power our transportation. There are two roads to take. The one is to seize this opportunity of public awareness and, uh, and the, the oil shock uh, to take the steps necessary to go forward with the full range of uh, alternative uh, energy options for us, uh, including alternative fuel sources and wind power and nuclear power and uh, a, a more shift in, uh, to electric uh, cars and trucks and more diversification of uh, sources of carbon energy, offshore drilling and so forth. We then can see a future where we're certainly still going to be using uh, oil but we are so much less dependent on foreign sources of that oil that the, the ability of any coalition to totally disrupt uh, and bring uh, catastrophe to our way of life is removed from them. We also need to think differently about how we do things. Can we have the same comfort by doing things differently? And it really starts demand across the board. How you build a building, how you insulate, how you locate a building vis-a-vis -vis trees, simple things that we used to think more about than we do now, or we, we are actually thinking more and more about them now, but we need to think more about them. And it just goes across the board, uh, from how you build a building, how you locate it, how you design it, how you uh, locate uh, uh, communities, how you design road systems, transport systems, how we rethink all of those things. That's where we should be coming from right now. What the country needs to do is get off oil as its primary fuel for transportation. 
so that we're not 97% reliant on this fuel for transportation with no alternatives. That will require electrification of our transportation sector with a healthy dose of third generation biofuels in order to run our fleet of cars. That allows fuel choice for the consumer as well as using domestically based uh, fuels in order to uh, fuel our fleets. Um, at the same time, one needs to implement uh, fuel economy standards so that we're reducing the demand of our oil and our economy is less dependent on oil for, for every dollar of economic output. We're becoming more efficient. And then um, increase domestic oil and natural gas production, both to leave more money in the United States so we're sending less um, overseas. Um, so we're not borrowing money from the Chinese in order to purchase this oil, but getting domestic-based fuels. And at the same time, to pay through royalties of our own domestic oil structure the transition off of oil. And what we do with that money is actually increase the R&D, but most importantly, the commercialization budgets of our government to help with this transition. And so we should be increasing um, this R, D, and D, research, development, and deployment budget, probably tenfold from what is about $3 billion today to something more like $30 billion, which is commensurate with what the National Institute of Health makes, which is commensurate with the security risk we face. 2008 should finally mark for us the opportunity America actually has. Energy, climate change, energy security coming together like it has in the past year should speak volumes to the American public and to our political leaders. For us to take a leadership position in the world, we have not done that yet. We can do it. And the funniest of the way the world is really waiting, if we don't actually take what we know we can do and take this leadership position, the world will not be the world we like to see happen. We can shape the future. We can also let others shape it for us and determine the shape of that world for us. This is a time when the world looks to America and says, we need your leadership. We don't want to work with you, but we need your leadership. And now is the time for us to embrace it and take it. And if we don't use the next year to do that, someone else will determine where we're going. The other path is n to lose this opportunity, to let uh, special interests block each of the measures that can together bring us to this point, and to have the kind of uh, partisan gridlock in Congress and special interest uh, obstructionism that has characterized and prevented many of these improvements being done in the past, and our vulnerability will continue to grow if that is the case. There is no one magic answer to this problem. This requires a coherent, integrated strategy pushing all of these alternatives uh, simultaneously, and it can work. But if it, if it doesn't, if we disintegrate into national, into special interests and uh, partisan blockage in Congress, then uh, we face a bleak, bleak future where uh, countries who wish us ill will have the tools to, uh, to make bad things happen to uh, Americans and American life. We are going to need a kind of leadership that you know, speaks to the American people about the true frailty of our economy, that talks about the extent to which our environment is being imperiled by our choices that relate to energy, and that calls upon the American public to be part of a long-term solution that doesn't say this is going to be cheap or easy, that acknowledges that there's no free lunch. And I, I think that there is a deep you know, vein of patriotism that runs through this country that is ready to be engaged with. And we look at climate change, look at energy secu security, the opportunities are so rich for each of us to say, I can do things now that will have a positive impact on how the world will look 25 and 30 years from now. There are changes that are now needed across the globe uh, where energy is the center to those changes that we can actually make. To solve water problems, we need energy. Clean water needs energy. Alleviation of poverty needs energy. Sanitation needs energy. Whatever you look at to make the world a better place, you need energy in massive forms and massive volumes, but in a different way from it in the past. 
you know, as Americans, we need to care about our national security, our economic security, our ecological security, and the pathway to all of those accomplishments depends upon breaking this addiction to oil, diversifying the types of fuels we use, and moving away from kind of high carbon polluting fuels to cleaner, higher tech options. We can now look at the world and say, I want to be like a grandparent who says, I left the world a better place for my children. And they can look back and say, that's my grandparents' legacy. They made it better for me. And that's a wonderful way to begin to look at the world. And it doesn't matter whether you're 58 or 38, the 38-year-old can say the same thing about the children they have or hope to have. Because all I know, having had the benefit and good fortune of meeting students in schools, from first grade to college students, they expect it of us. And I don't want to let them down. Imagine round-the-clock risk management and customer support. You're not imagining it. It's ICE. Trade the world. Deloitte's Energy and Resources Practice is pleased to sponsor Oil Shockwave. 